Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. Welcome to Bringing Bible Church. So, to start off, the other day I was having this polite, loving conversation with some other people on Facebook. You know how that goes. Now, I was in a group where, you know, I'm under the assumption these people are similarly minded to us in things of eschatological work. The actual topic that was posted was something along the line of the fella had posted a thing saying, the Bible says son of God, yet never uses the term God the son. It just comes short, short and sweet like that. So my response to that was, again, just figured, short and sweet, I said there really was no need for such language to be used because the ancient Hebrews, hearing the words of Christ and the apostles, understood full well what was meant when Christ used the term Son of God as well as the term Son of Man. This type of post ended up, of course, attracting a lot of odd responses. But in a Christian forum like this, I did not necessarily expect that there would be such ignorance and confusion as I found to be the case. I guess for me, most of this was just Christianity 101. I guess that's probably because I was brought up in a you know, more orthodox, Trinitarian type church. And so at times, maybe I just assume too much of other people. You find that out on Facebook for sure, especially of those who follow our eschatological camp more or less. The saddest part about it was as I discussed these things with them, I started to realize that a lot of the error that they were having was just because of looking at the English translation. I mean, we find that all the time. They're looking and saying, well, this word means this. So, and it becomes quite a shallow understanding. They read the English. They take them a little too literally at times. They apply a modern thought and a modern meaning to it. And while on the surface these English words may appear to cause confusion, it's not something that you can't resolve by just studying the words throughout Scripture entirely. One of the major hurdles that as modern readers that we have is our modern worldview. Now, we hear this message from this pulpit all the time. The context of the Bible is not the context of, is of our context is not the context of the Bible. The worldview of the Bible is not our worldview. It is not our modern worldview or culture that is presented within the pages of Scripture and we cannot impose it upon them. Because of that, it requires us to understand the culture and the worldview of the writers of Scripture in order to properly grasp what they are saying. I get so confused and frustrated when somebody tells me that that's not the case. It's just kind of sadly humorous. But one of the issues we find with Scriptures and English translations is that the words in the original language do not always have one concrete meaning as we try to force upon them. They can have various nuances and uses over time that may not be as easy to pick up on from comparing a few literal translations of a word that get used here and there. I believe this is a large part of the problem with the terms we're discussing today. The key words in discussion will be firstborn and begotten when used in the context of Jesus. Now Dave has has touched on this term, these terms in the past. Not even very long ago he did. But usually it's just a quick comment in whatever the content and context is that he's using at that point. I wanted to kind of bring these together, a little more detail and an extensive look all into one message. I initially thought this would be a quick and easy topic. I had planned on what I was going to say, where I wanted to go with it. But then actually when I got into it and started studying a little further, I started making other connections that I hadn't even considered beforehand. And I really wanted to go in so many other directions that could bolster this opinion, this position, but I had to pull back on the reins and trim so much of it to keep it simple and more precise. So let's jump right in. We'll look at this term, firstborn. Now on the surface, a word like firstborn may seem cut and dry. When we look at such such examples as Genesis 43, and they were seated before him from the firstborn according to his birthright to the youngest according to his youth, and the men looked at one another amazed. Or Numbers 3, these are the names of the descendants of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. 
Or when you go to Numbers 3.12, I myself received the Levites from the midst of the Israelites in the place of all the firstborns of the offspring of the womb from the Israelites. The Levites will be mine because all the firstborn are mine. On the day of, all, of my killing all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for myself all the firstborn in Israel, both humankind and animal. They will be mine. I am Yahweh. Or Hebrews 11, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood in order that the one who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. So in each instance, it seems pretty obvious that the firstborn being spoken of is indeed the child born first chronologically in line to a family. Now, before going any further, though, just keep in mind, in our culture, we don't really understand the emphasis or significance of what it means to be the firstborn as it did in their culture. The firstborn had privileges that the other siblings did not have. They received a special blessing and special authority when it was passed down from their father. There was something real that happened between father and the firstborn son, something we have a hard time comprehending or fully understanding. We see the story, for instance, of uh, of Jacob and Esau, how Jacob dressed up and pretended to be his brother Esau and came to their father and deceived him and received his brother's blessing. As soon as he had received the blessing from their father Isaac, Jacob left, and in came Esau. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau came, his brother came in from hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me, and I ate it before you came, and I have blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me even also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Genesis 27. So while we in our culture may not fully grasp the deep significance of what this apparently substantive blessing was, it was something that was real and irreversible at that time. So even applying just this natural, physical aspect of what it meant to be firstborn, if we apply that idea to what Jesus means to Jesus, it means something still very significant and blessed about him. The issue for most is how they force their view of the word born, that part of the word, onto things. I believe the idea, this idea may suitably be considered a type, an anti-type type situation where the physical firstborn male child of Israel had a special blessing under the Father and we can apply all of that to Jesus, the true Israel, in a grander, more fulfilled spiritual realm type of way. And then we briefly look at this word begotten, which likewise tends to confuse some who only read it in English and take this basic surface level view. The word appears in one of the scriptures that most everyone knows by heart. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, this has brought confusion to many who do not stop and think and study this through. Not only do some of the more cultic religions get it wrong, but even some in the more orthodox camps have gotten seriously messed up here. I believe the confusion comes from at least two different angles, actually. The use of the word itself, as well as, as well as a faulty understanding of what the idea of a son of God means. Just like the term firstborn, if you apply a wooden meaning to begotten every time it occurs, it will lead to these types of problems. When you read through the Hebrew Scriptures, we often read how so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so over here begat so-and-so. And, of course, we understand that this is a, indeed speaking of parents having children. Many will then apply logic that since that is the use of the word, when Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God, then there must have been a time when Yahweh, the Father, begat the Son, right? Obviously, most everyone will grab the concordance, they look up the meaning of the original word, and then they apply that meaning consistently throughout all of its uses in Scripture. Sadly, this is not always a proper way to interpret things. As many words have multiple meanings and nuances, which is why oftentimes there are numerous meanings listed in the concordances. It requires knowing how words may have changed in meaning or use at different times in ancient history. Since the average reader and often teacher does not study deep enough to figure this out, 
mistaken applications can get taught. This type of understanding and logic has led some people down the path of believing Christ, the Son, at one point didn't exist, and that Yahweh begat him or created him, making him, the Son, the first creation, the firstborn of God. But is that what it always means? Is Jesus a son begotten or born to God like, he think, like we think of as humans are being born? The problem is threefold at a minimum as far as the terminology is concerned. So here are the three points that I wish to discuss today. What does it mean to be a son of God? How is Jesus the firstborn? How is Jesus the begotten? So, point one, what does it mean to be a son of God? At this point, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here since this topic has been covered in great detail in many prior messages. I will simply remind you that the Hebrews, the first century Christians, and the early church leaders all understood that the term sons of God, B'nai Elohim, speaks of spiritual realm beings. In fact, the term Elohim is never used in Scripture to speak of any being except those in the spirit realm never about a man or a worldly creature. For a much more detailed look at this topic, go back 2015 to Dave's six-part series, but look at the sixth part in the Spiritual Warfare series where he deals with it greatly. Time doesn't permit to go any further than that. I just remind you, that's the stance. Here in this congregation, you are more familiar with this type of material as the idea of the Divine Council worldview has been taught by us. But sadly, it is ignorance of this fact that tends to start the ball rolling off track for many today. They simply look at saying Son of God as if it means he is the literal created offspring of the Father. They may associate the term Son of God with the fact that the Spirit came and overshadowed the Virgin Mary, causing this supernatural birth that is directly from God. Therefore, Jesus the man is the literal Son of God. Such a view requires no thought of a preexistent Christ, though most Orthodox believers do tend to believe that as well. Had everyone possessed the divine council background and worldview, understanding as the Hebrews held, chances are less likely that they would travel down the road to such error as we find today. So a root of the problem seems to definitely stem from ignorance of this point. It was here that I had to refrain from straying off into a whole different background study of the first century understanding and the second temple view of the terms of the term Son of God and Son of Man. Back at our spring conference in 2015, I gave a lecture on the influence of the Book of Enoch in the New Testament. In it, I covered how many Messianic terms mentioned in the New Testament are used and applied based on how they were discussed and defined in Second Temple writings like the Book of Enoch. It shows how the worldview and understanding of many of these terms during the first century were incorporated into the New Testament writings. Now, you could find those blog posts on the Divine Council page under the Studies tab on our main BereanBibleChurch.org site. So you can go read that further. I won't, again, stray off into a long discussion there. Basically, because of this understood background in Second Temple literature, when Jesus comes onto the scene claiming to be the Son of God as well as the Son of Man, the Hebrew people would have immediately understood what he was implying about himself. He was claiming to be related to and descended from those beings in the spirit realm. This makes him much more than simply a human being like them, which is in fact what he was saying, and they knew it, even if some modern readers today do not grasp that. Numerous times he told them in language they understood that he was sent from the Father, came down from above, preexisted his human form, etc. They often understood his words and implications, but they did not like them. Not so much simply because of what he was saying with his claims, as they already had a good idea what they might be looking for, and they knew the timing was about right, but because they had expected expectations of a divine political leader type. They rejected him because in their thoughts, the one they expected would be and act much differently than he was acting. So... The background we have to understand is that Jesus is a son of God, a spirit realm being that existed before his fleshly birth as Jesus the man. He is referred to as the firstborn of God. As mentioned, based on the use of terms firstborn discussed before, some want to say that this means that the preexistent Christ was the first creation, the one who was born first from the Father. This issue, 
the issue we run into with this word firstborn is that it not, does not always fit as used to, for a literal, chronologically firstborn member to a family. For instance, how can we force the chronological idea of first child when it gets applied to David, the son of Jesse? If you recall, David is one of eight sons and is, in fact, the youngest. First Samuel tells us, Now David was the son of an Ephratite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went into the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. So David's the youngest of eight. And if we were to stick to a strict meaning of the term, firstborn, then there's no way that you could say David was the firstborn, right? Yet we find in Psalm 89, I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So when you look through this word throughout Scripture, you begin to hopefully realize that by firstborn, it does not always mean those who are chronologically born first in line. Adam Clark puts it this way, Firstborn is not always to be understood literally in Scripture. It often signifies simply a well-beloved or best-loved son, one preferred to all the rest and distinguished by some eminent prerogative. I believe he pretty much hits the nail on the head here, and this is how we have to look at times at how this word may be being used. Yet many fail to understand this. We also see a use of it in Exodus 4. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Well, if Israel is God's firstborn son, then how is Jesus the firstborn son of God? How can you have two firstborns? How is Israel born at all in a physical sense? Here, as in the use regarding David, the term is used to mean they are special, blessed, in a place of special blessing by God. If you stop to think about it, as mentioned, this special place idea is pretty much exactly applicable to those who are literally real firstborn children. They too are said to hold a special place, as we saw, of blessing and authority from God. Now, continuing on with another use of firstborn, how about the use we find in Jeremiah 31? With weeping they shall come, and with pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am the father of it to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Like in the case of David, Ephraim, the person is not the firstborn chronologically. Now, in some cases, Ephraim is used for the person. In other places, he's used for the tribe of people. And quite often, it's used as a substitute for the name of the whole name of Israel. So in this case, it would pretty much be the same as when he in Exodus when he said that Israel is his firstborn. But in both instances, it does not refer to something being the first to be born or created. The way some teach that Christ was the first creation of Yahweh, the first thing he did in creation, they would have to somehow also say that Israel was first to be created and that David is somehow first to be born. It becomes quite foolish to apply it that way. In these few examples, it is used to state that these parties are special. They are called out as blessed, distinguished, or preferred. And when applied to Christ, being called firstborn, therefore does not require it to imply that he was created first, but that he likewise is is special and distinguished. The verse we examined, examined in Psalms a moment ago seems to indeed make this direct connection. It says, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, first off, it says David will be made firstborn. The word for make in this context is not to make as in create like you might initially think. It means to give, set, assign, appoint, or designate. So David will be appointed as firstborn, a special place of favor. And being put into that place, he is then considered the highest of the kings of the earth. The verse is basically giving us a more proper understanding for the term firstborn. It's to be designated as firstborn, which would make them the highest. On top of that, this psalm is acknowledged as a messianic psalm, meaning what is being said here of David is a type, with the true antitype applying this designation to as king 
to Christ himself. Christ was made firstborn, designated, set apart as better, more blessed and distinguished. But set apart and better than whom? Better and higher than the other sons of God. Jesus, like the angels, is part of a body of beings in the spiritual realm that are known as sons of God. Remember, a son of God, this term is not necessarily referencing a specific type of being. In other words, Jesus is not necessarily on the same level as a created angel. Remember, Elohim is more of a reference to a location and not to a specific type of being. This is to say that he is a being in the same spiritual realm alongside of the other beings like the angels. The Greek word behind firstborn is the word protakotkos. Protakotkos. And that would, word comes from the root word protos, which means foremost in time, place, order, or importance. So while it can be used to spe- be specifically about something first in an order, like a chronological firstborn child, it is also used in Scripture to refer to someone or thing first or of more importance in rank. For instance, in Luke we find the word, and he was teaching every day in the temple courts, and the chief priests and the scribes and the most prominent men of the people were seeking to destroy him. The special people, the chief of the Jews, as some translations put it, are referred to with this term. So it is definitely has a related meaning as used for someone special or of higher class and not simply in a chronological use. Once we understand that this term firstborn can mean that the one spoken of is special and first in rank and not necessarily first in existence, we can now look back at other places where the understanding appears. Where else can we go to bear, to to hear of Christ being different and better? Well, the book of Hebrews, which was read at the start, it opens with the case for the supremacy of Christ. It says, although God spoke long ago in many parts and in many ways to the fathers by the prophets, in these last days he had spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So in those last days, Yahweh began speaking through a son. And this particular son had been appointed as heir and was the one who made the worlds. Now, your translation may say that he spoke to us by the son or by his son, but those terms have been added erroneously by the translator. The fact is the Greek has no definite article when you come to the noun about his son, nor is there a possessive pronoun. It is literally that he spoke to us by a son. Chances are the translators make it his son or the son, again, because of a lack of understanding of their part, on their part of the Hebrew concept of the divine council context. Even most commentators who do recognize this as being properly translated as a son tend to still make the mistake of explaining that it obviously means the son or his son since they say God doesn't have but one son. Without a divine council context, saying that there are multiple sons of God does sound strange. And while we know that there are others designated as the Son of God, Hebrews explains that this Son is very different and significant. While we know this section in Hebrews is speaking of Jesus the Christ, note also it is saying this Son clearly pre-existed before he was born as Jesus the man into this world, for it states that he is the one who made the world. Sadly, I've even run across some who associate in our groups who try to state that Christ did not pre-exist prior to the birth on earth. At first, I thought they might just be playing with words. Since saying Jesus didn't exist, maybe they meant when he was born as Jesus the man that he had never existed before as Jesus the man. But to try and deny any preexistence of the son that came to be born as the man is actually inconceivable in light of Scripture. Now, moving on, Hebrews tells us that this son is special and above the angels because he has traits that the other sons do not have. When he has made purification for sins through him, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become by so much better than the angels, by as much as he has inherited a more excellent name than theirs. For to which of the angels did he say, ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be his father and he will be my son. No angel was ever given or designated with a special privilege as his son did. 
as this son did. For of all the sons, which of them were ever declared begotten? We can see how this often confused word begotten now is starting to pop up in here as it says that this son was begotten. Now before moving on to that, and I don't want to go off on a tangent here. Well, I kind of do, but I don't want to. Um, I can't help but raise this question or this point. Now this is directed to those who deny the existence of a heavenly being or the heavenly beings known as angels, believing that this term always refers to human messengers. If that is the case, What's the, what is the significance of saying here that Jesus is much better than other human messengers? Or in what way, like in Hebrews 2, which we haven't read here, but in Hebrews 2 it says that Jesus was made a little lower than other human messengers? Is that what we mean by angels there? How was he made a little lower than other humans? I just don't get it, and it really makes nonsense of the comparison that we see here in Hebrews that it's declaring here. Human messengers are already mentioned in verse 1 where it says that God spoke through the prophets. Those are human messengers from God. Then you have this special son who is now speaking for Yahweh. Then we are told more details about this son, and we find out that he is not just another human messenger like the prophets were. He is the essence of Yahweh and obviously preexisted his becoming human. This makes him to be much more than a human and puts him into a whole other class of being. Then even farther, this son does a work, he dies, and sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. This term majesty here is used for someone of greatness and is understood of divinity, of God himself. Along with the majesty on high, obviously not on earth, we find that there are these angels, also known elsewhere as sons of God. Angels have also been messengers from God to man in the past, but are obviously being mentioned here to contrast and be noted as a different type of being from the human prophets already mentioned. In taking such a human messenger view for angels, you end up with, the he with Hebrews stating that there were human prophets, a pre-existent son who walked among other sons of God, understood his angels elsewhere, and how this special son was somehow created lower than these other human messengers. Yet, in, in fact, he's being called out as better and higher than those human messenger angels. So it really kind of, if the writer intended to imply humans in all cases, he uses terms each time that really make it impossible to understand what he's saying. Plus, in light of what we know the common Hebrew understanding was of angels at the time, it becomes absolutely humorous for someone to claim that angels simply meant human messengers to those people. Again, just because they take a wooden, literal meaning for the term angels. However, if we properly understand what Christ has, that Christ has been seated in the same upper realm and is among those other spiritual beings known as angels, then we can see it is saying that of all of these beings in the realm, he is the highest of the sons and rules in the thr on a throne alongside the high majesty. Again, this failed understanding of angels in the spiritual realm comes from an ignorance of the Hebrew concept of the divine council. With the divine council context in mind, as the first century hearers had, the contrast being made here in Hebrews is much more powerful of a declaration that Christ about Christ than in his whole than if this whole thing were simply about types of humans. Now, let's get back on the point. That was a little rabbit trail there. Let's begin looking at this word begotten. As mentioned, we have a long history of people who begat this one and that one, and we understand this as having children. And because of the metaphor of father and son used by Yahweh and Christ, people want to apply this use of begotten son as likewise being a child that is in some way created or birthed. Because of that, the idea of Christ being Yahweh's first creation is considered valid by some. Yet like the term firstborn, this term begotten also has multiple nuances and does not always mean to birth a child. There are two things I'd like to point out that should kind of jump out at as being kind of basic logic, I would think. In this passage in Hebrews, it says, For which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? If this was trying to imply that Jesus was created, begotten in the sense of having a starting point of existence, then how does this statement make any sense? Are not angels considered created, begotten things in that created creation sense? And if they were likewise created as Christ was, would they not also be similarly sons? 
If that is the use of begotten here, then it would apply to the angels too, as they were begotten or created and sons because they have a beginning. So for the question, for which of his angels did he ever say today I have begotten you, the answer seems logical that it should be all of them, as all of them had a first day of existence after creation and all of them are sons of God. It should be obvious from the start then that begotten here is not about being created or born as it might be used to state at other times. Yahweh is clearly differentiating between this one son and all the other sons, of, of a, sons or angels. This one is different, and the term begotten is being used here to say just that. There is something different with this one, a difference that cannot be claimed by any of the others, something that none of the others possess that cannot be applied to them in any way. Therefore, it seems quite obvious this term cannot be speaking of a creation date, which all of the others do have. Let me now quote another wise teacher on this topic. Well, more specifically on the topic of only begotten in John 3.16, as we saw earlier. It's a slightly different term with more of a focus on the word only, but the application is still related. He says, how could Yeshua be the one divine son when there were other sons of God? The answer to this is that only begotten is an unfortunate, confusing translation, especially to modern years. Not only does the translation only begotten seem to contradict the obvious statements in the Tanakh about other sons of God, it implies that there was a time when the son did not exist, that he had a beginning. The word monogenes doesn't mean only begotten in some sort of birthing sense. The confusion extends from an old misunderstanding of the root of the Greek word. For years, monogenes was thought to, de to have derived from the two Greek terms, monos only, and geneo, to beget or bear. Greek scholars later discovered that the second part of the word monogenes does not come from the Greek verb genao, but rather from the noun genos, which means class or kind. The term literally means one of a kind or unique without connotation of created origin. And this other teacher happens to be somebody we know named David Curtis, <laughs> which was a couple months ago uh, in John 3.16. And he's not here to even hear his name. Oh, darn. You just missed your name being called. Now, an example we could look at that was also looked at by Dave Beck in that message is the term as it's used in Hebrews, where we are told, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So it says Isaac is Abraham's only begotten, his monogenes. Since we know that Isaac was born, that before Isaac was born, Abraham had fathered Ishmael, then Isaac had not, Isaac was not an only begotten in the term, if the term is only used to speak of a literal birth. The term is used here to mean that Isaac was Abraham's unique son, and he was the son of the covenant promises. It is Isaac's genealogical line that would be the one through which the Messiah would come. So monogenes means one kind, unique or only, or the only one of its kind. We also find this begotten phrase used elsewhere, and the usages also steer the understanding away from it having anything to do with a start date or a birth of his son. These next few points were brought out in a recent podcast discussion by Michael Heiser. He is the ancient languages scholar that is going to be speaking at our conference this year. He directs the attention to Acts 13 where we are told, and when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says yet also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. In this context, the phrase about the son being begotten 
is used in conjunction with the resurrection event that Christ went through. So again, this phrase cannot be linked to any kind of creation or birth event here as it is being applied to something significant directly connected to the resurrection of Jesus. And then another time, as it appears in Hebrews 5, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorance and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes his honor, dishonor for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In this context, the phrase about being begotten is used in connection with the priestly office of Christ. Again, nothing to do with a beginning or a creation idea. Now, if you were not aware from the start, this phrase is actually a quote from Psalm 2. And likewise, when used there, it has nothing to do with creation or birth. So right from the start, the topic is about rulers on the earth conspiring against the Lord's anointed one, and Yahweh's response is appropriate. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds and cast apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. <clears throat> so aside from laughing, Yahweh has set his king on Zion. And what does he say about this king that he set up? I will tell you of a decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The context here is of one being called out, declared as a position of kingship and authority of some sort. The statement about being a son and the declaring of the son as begotten is a declaration of someone becoming an authority and ruler, a kingship situation, and has nothing to do with any way with the creation or birth of someone. And with that in mind, we look back at the verses we've been discussing in the New Testament, and we find that they likewise relate in the same way with this type of use. In the opening Hebrews passages, the special son is being called out from all the others and declared begotten. As, and if you read the whole first chapter as we did in the beginning... You cannot miss the, pur the purpose of this all. Here are some of the highlights. As we have seen in verses 1 and 2, we are told that the son is now the mouthpiece of Yahweh instead of the prophets of old. And this son is the heir of all things. It says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. See that translation in the ESV says his son. Whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. Then in verse 3 and 4, we are told that the special traits of the Son, of the special traits that make him worthy and different, as well as the results of the work that he accomplished. It says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The Son is an exact imprint of Yahweh, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after he atoned for sin, he sat down at the seat of power, the right hand of Yahweh on high. This is the Son taking a kingly co-ruler position with Yahweh. And notice that what it states next. After this position of authority is mentioned, it is then directly connected with the phrase about being begotten. For the very next verse is where we got it. For of which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or again I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. In verses 8 and 9 we again have the son spoken of as taking the throne 
as well as being anointed with oil, which is also typical for one taking a position of authority. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond his companions. And while we already asked, he already asked which of the angels has ever been declared begotten, he re- reiterates it with the further connection as it relates to a position of authority when in verse 13 he asks, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? This special son makes a purification for sin and sits at the right hand of Yahweh, taking a throne and position of authority. And this is tied to his being declared as begotten and taking a position above that of the angels. This is all the context of kingship, and these terms are directly connected to that. Notice also that here is mentioned another quote, the sit at my right hand portion, this time taken from Psalm 110, and guess what the topic of, psalm, of that psalm is? It's the rulership of a coming Messiah, for it tells us, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand, He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. So the sitting at the right hand is clearly related to taking a ruler position. But what event had to occur in connection with his making the purification of sin before he could take that right hand position? Well, the purification of sin required his death on the cross, which of course follows was followed by his resurrection, which is exactly what we saw earlier that the connection that Paul made by using that term in Acts 13. We read it earlier, it says, and we will will bring you the good news that God promised to the fathers that this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So again, the resurrection is connected to being called a begotten son. Then, as we saw in Hebrews 5, the term is again connected to the son becoming the high priest. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but was appointed by him who said, You are my son today, I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So in the end, with all of this, we can deduce that this son is special, called out, declared significant by using this term begotten, and that this is tied to his being the ultimate prophet, priest, and king over all creation. And that this begotten quote, originally from Psalm 2, is likewise related to the anointed one being established as ruler and king of creation. Want a little more proof? Let's look quickly at our initial verse back in Hebrews. For which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be his father, and he will be my son. What about this last part about being a father and him being a son? It seems obviously a quote, like the other one. So what is this referring to? It's quoting 2 Samuel 7. So let us look at a decent chunk of that to get the context. A little longer reading here. Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all of your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name and I will establish a throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. There's that quote. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, and my steadfast love will not depart from him as I 
took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And you, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. This is a Davidic covenant. This is about the kingship of David. And notice the placement of our phrase. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. This phrase is connected essentially to the son of David. This, to this son, God will be a father. This son will build God a house. So we're obviously talking about Solomon, right? David's son, Solomon, who built the most wonderful temple back in the day, Solomon was wise. His kingdom grew with peace and greatness. So how does this little phrase regarding Solomon have anything to do with being applied to Jesus? I believe what we have here is yet another case of a type and anti-type. Solomon is the type, the literal son of David that physically built the temple. But Christ is the anti-type fulfillment of this. Christ is wisdom. Christ brings peace. And he likewise built the house, a tabernacle for Yahweh, when he himself, with, where he himself was the chief cornerstone and his people were the bricks. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself, Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his Spirit. And is this Jesus not clearly considered and referred to as the son of David? Hopefully, if you read your Bible, you'll say yes. For these people seem to think so. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him. So that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? No, this is not Solomon. Um, and behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they crowd, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And in Matthew 22, now when the, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. So it seems clear that the people of his day understood the prophecy of 2 Samuel and that reference to the son of David and how it would be fulfilled by the Messiah. Christ is that son of David. And as his son, this verse in 2 Samuel about the kingship of David and later his son and their throne is applicable to all that Christ did. Therefore, this verse about God being his father and he being the son and its relationship to kingship are further solidified. So with all of the evidence, we can deduce that this term about being begotten in referencing to the son can be summed up as not being about the birth or creation of Christ at all. It is instead directly related to the declaration or inauguration of the kingship of the resurrected high priest, the eternal son. Jesus became king when he sat down at the right hand of majesty, a prophecy laid out in Psalm 110, a psalm dealing with the establishment of a kingly ruler from God. His sitting at the right hand as king took place after he was resurrected, which took place after he was sacrificed, all of which we have seen are steps connecting to this phrase, today I have begotten you. Yahweh is saying, today I have called you out, established you in this position to ultimately achieve all that was beforehand spoken of by my human kings, priests, and children. The evidence is clear that this term begotten as well as firstborn, when used in relation to Christ the Son, have nothing to do with, chronolog with the chronology of a birth or of a creation. The only way to make such a case is to strip them out of their context, both the context of the text in which they appear, as well as the context of the worldview and understanding of the people using them at the time. Quoting from Heiser again, he states it like this, I would say, based on these usages, this variety, that anyone who would connect the phrase, today I have begotten you, 
with the origin of Jesus as though he was not preexistent is simply guilty of ignoring the scriptural use of the phrase. It's pretty much that simple. Now, I especially love his later comments after that as they relate directly to the circumstance discussing my starting on this with Facebook. And speaking of how people are going, no matter what you teach them, they're going to always take things out of context and continue to confuse things. He puts it this way. He says, just because we make these points doesn't mean people aren't going to do it, continue to abuse it. They are going to do it. They're going to do it every day. You're going to see it on Facebook. You're going to see it all over the place, all over the web. You're going to run into people at work. You're going to, you'll get into a religious discussion, and you'll find someone who rejects the eternality or the, or the preexistence of the deity of Christ. This is what you're going to get if they're taught. This is what you're going to get. Next time you get it, though, ask, you know that phrase, you are my son, today I've begotten you, that we were talking about? Where are the other two passages that it's used? I'll bet they don't know. So an honest study will have to admit that it is near impossible when comparing Scripture to Scripture and considering the Hebrew worldview to come away with this idea that this term begotten or firstborn when found in the context as it appears in these verses regarding the Son could ever be misconstrued to apply to a birth, beginning, or creation of Christ the Son. Sadly, these types of mistakes are made because people don't know, read, or study the Scriptures like they should. They are not so entrenched in God's word as to quickly be able to connect these connections that we've seen today. Or they are ignorant of the worldview that is portrayed in Scripture. There are many people who make theological decisions based on what they have been taught by someone or by simply not going any deeper than reading the English text. And even then they read it out of context. And then they come to conclusions on their own that lead them down these paths. Few people take the time to fully study the context, the original languages, the ancient usage, the worldview of the writings, and all that is involved. And yet they stand firm, argue, and defend their position based upon such a weak foundation. Now, don't get deterred by this thought. True, not everyone has the time, the skills, or the know-how to do the kind of extensive work needed to dig as deep as is often required to get to a much clearer understanding as we've seen on this. It does re often require the assistance of others with more skill. But it doesn't require all the extra work to have a good foundation of Scripture in general. When it comes to topics like this and so many more, the extensive study is not fully needed to fir at first in order to avoid much of the confusion and error in one's theology. Oftentimes, just a good familiarity with the whole of the Word of God and the full story presented it will get you a long way in alerting someone to the inconsistencies and questionable divergence from the theme of Scripture. When you better understand the entire story, all the pieces and the details, it becomes much easier to spot someone's teaching that totally doesn't seem to line up or actually goes contrary to the storyline somewhere. Then you can focus in and do additional study on such an issue to acquire more clarity. But first and foremost, you have to know the word thoroughly. As usual, with today being the end of the year, David's already done this, so he blew the whole ending of my message. Tomorrow's the start of a new year. We wish to challenge you to either start a Bible plan or continue a yearly Bible plan. It is a new year resolution that keeps on giving for the child of God. I recently overheard, overheard a Christian lady who was brought up in the church, still very active in the church to this day, now in her mid-40s, she stated that she has never read the Bible all the way through. <clears throat> Don't be content to be like that. Don't be a child of Yahweh who doesn't even know what Yahweh has fully said. While churchianity is diseased with the sad ignorance of God's word, let 2018 be your chance to become part of the cure. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the many aspects of it that, that you've given throughout a long time and in so many different writings. We just thank you so much for having that still that we can read and understand what message you would have us to have. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us not take it for granted. As was already stated, we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to establish and and stick to a plan that doesn't require much more than 15 minutes of our time. 
just to become familiar with it, just so we would know everything that's in there. The more we read it, the more we pick up, the more we would see when somebody comes up with an odd verse that we're like, well, that doesn't quite make sense. We just pray that you would help us to have that wisdom, that you would help us to have the determination to stick to a plan, to become more knowledgeable, to not be those type of church people that just go to church and listen to what the pastor says, but that you would help us to read your word, to be entrenched in it, to be desirous of knowing what you would have us to know. We thank you so much for all that we have and for this time. We just pray that you would bless it. Amen. Amen.